Welcome back, everybody, to our incredible 50-hour online vigil in solidarity with Julian Assange and with WikiLeaks. My name is Susie Dawson. I am the president of the Internet Party of New Zealand, an activist and a journalist, and it is my extreme pleasure to be here with a renowned author, radio host, poet, and journalist, an epic journalist of three decades, Dennis J. Bernstein. You also may have heard Dennis's recent uh, collaboration with Randy Critico from Live on the Fly on KPFA Radio, where Dennis and Randy have been interviewing dozens of incredible people about Julian Assange's plight and about the importance and significance of WikiLeaks. Welcome to the stream, Dennis. Thank you, Susie, and thank you for what you're doing. It's incredibly important. Thank you. I just think it's so long overdue, and I'm so pleased to see the amazing response from people. There really are countless people out there who've just been waiting to have an opportunity, an avenue to show their support for Julian and for WikiLeaks. Well, we really believe in the work of WikiLeaks. Uh, we uh, do believe that speaking truth to power is what it's about, that the job of journalists and publisher is, publishers uh, is to monitor the centers of power and report back to the people. And that uh, really in a nutshell is what Julian Assange did uh, in a global fashion with great effectiveness. Um, so uh, those of us journalists who love to uh, have documents to back up the work and the kinds of reporting we do in the field uh, owe a great deal to Julian Assange. And it, it hurts me deeply. You know, there, there's sort of like a traffic jam between my heart and my mind when I think about this. But when I think of all uh, my brethren and sistren in the mainstream who have used the incredible work of Julian Assange, who have, shall we say, since their corporate operations, made lots of money on the work of Julian Assange, on the documents that he released, to see them turn their backs, to, to see the press become stenographers for the State Department uh, and prosecutors who uh, I have heard call for Julian Assange to be brought before the dock and investigated. It's shocking to me. So there's a little heart jam there, but uh, I'm happy to be here with you. Uh, and. Uh, there's a couple of different things I'd really like to talk about when it comes to the, uh, you know, the context, uh, the role that Julian Assange played in making sure that we all had context to the so-called news of the day and the, to the story unfolding in the moment. That context is what the corporate mainstream doesn't give us, and that's the profundity uh, of uh, an operation like like WikiLeaks. I say like WikiLeaks, there really isn't anything like it, but uh, that's uh, just a sense of how I'm feeling about uh, what's going on here. Well, look, I think they're walking in the footsteps of giants in terms of other transparency journalists and like Robert Parry, for example, classic example of an incredibly brave, incredibly principled journalist. This is, of course, the founder of Consortium News. And also yourself, Dennis, because you, your journalism has been very focused around human rights and around transparency and, and trying to hold power to account. So I know that you wanted to take us back a little bit and you wanted um, to talk about what led up, the events that led up to the Iraq war um, of course, WikiLeaks having published the Iraq war logs from Chelsea Manning, um, and that being such a significant set of disclosures. So go for it. Take us, take us for a walk down, you know, history lane. Thank you. Just to, just to spend a few minutes on the, the prequel, if you will, uh, to WikiLeaks. Um, uh, I hope you're still there. I lost your picture. Um, but the, what was happening? Who was the oh, who was the reporter, um, uh, the corporate reporter, the truth teller, supposedly uh, informing people from the fourth estate what was happening? Well, it was a woman by the name of Judith Miller. She was the lead reporter for the Times, the New York Times, and it turns out she was the key stenographer 
for the Bush administration that would support and expand the lie that got us into the Iraq war. And, and who was floating around at the time? People like Madeleine Albright. You remember that policy of the embargo on Iraq? Uh, and the how much the estimates are up 250,000 and more children died as a result of the embargo uh, to uh, in terms of Iraq. So um, this is where uh, a, a release a this is where Chelsea Manning, in the collaboration with WikiLeaks, enters the scene to change history by providing a real look at the implications through almost through one video of US policy in Iraq, the brutality and the way in which uh, uh, America and Great Britain and the West and all this, the, the sacred uh, uh, NATO, what they were really up to. And this is the policy where collateral murder, the release, the voice of Chelsea Manning, standing there at the crossroads of history, made a decision to change history. And that's why Chelsea Manning served seven years in solitary. And that's why we're, we're talking today, because we know that, that uh, that example set by a liberal, Barack Obama, is clearly what the US national security state has in store for Julian Assange if they have their way. Because when you speak truth to power, it has reverberations, ramifications. Julian Assange is facing that. It's always, you know, we, that, that phrase, um, Susie, truth to power, it's always interesting to me to, to watch it in action because when you, there's the person who's in their power, who's speaking up, who's speaking out, and there's that person in the position of power. Now, everybody knows who's telling the truth. It's clear to who's ever watching who's telling the truth. Will the truth teller, will the in this case, Julian Assange, the sort of the canary in the coal mine of corporate disinformation, will he be able to sustain the truth? Will the truth carry him through? Or will these people in positions of power be able to crush him and all of us? Because there's a lot at risk here, along with him in terms of telling the truth. It was interesting to note that the, the attorney for the New York Times happened to mention that the Times, if they prosecute Julian Assange, that the Times would also be liable because they're sort of, generally speaking, forgive me, Julian, in the same business. Um, in theory, in, in theory. In theory, right? Do you know what I'm saying? So uh, again, will the stenographers, will the, the note takers for the State Department, with, I always, I look at this, you know, the poetry comes out, I look at the word patriotism, and right smack in the, put it in capital letters, there's the word riot. Uh, and these journalists tend to riot in the name of patriotism. They, can, they think somehow that their job, this is the, the sort of the terrifying transformation. These journalists now think their job is, is to prosecute the truth uh, and to sustain uh, the corporate powers that be. And I, you know, again, I've seen this over my career in a lot of different ways. I don't know if you read the part of the history that says in 1999, I showed up at my own free speech radio station, the first listener supported station in the country. I actually showed up at the front door with Helen Caldicott, who was supposed to, uh, the great anti-nuclear activist who was supposed to come on the air with me that day. And I was met with uh, between six and eight armed men who informed me that they had just locked down Free Speech Pacifica KPFA radio uh, because the board, the liberal board, had decided that we had become dangerous. So I would have to go through a search to get into Free Speech radio. 
I wish I had running my tape recorder to hear Helen call the cops response to the fact that six to eight former FBI CIA agents had taken over free speech radio. While this was happening, by the way, the, the corporate mainstream was actually flying planes up around the radio station measuring to confirm that we had the strongest FM signal in Northern and Central California because they were about ready to take it over. This is what happens. This is how people connive and try and restrain the truth. And it happens from inside. You know, we saw it happen. It was an inside job. My own board came to get me. I was dragged, they, they literally uh, stopped us on the air. I was dragged out in handcuffs. I was arrested in my own newsroom in free speech America. So think about it. This is what happens. I'm just sort of, this is where my heart goes out to Julian because you know, there's that, there's that, uh, saying truth has few friends and those few are suicides. You know, you think, you don't want to think that telling the truth, you're committing your journalistic suicide, but this is what happens. Am I going on? No, I am currently typing out a tweet quoting that you, what you just said. You said, I was dragged out. I was arrested in my own newsroom in Free Speech America, Dennis J. Bernstein, and I'm just tweeting that out right now with the link to the stream. How can many I, people could... How many people can say that? Can I, and one more part of that story that's very important. So um, what happened was I had gotten a, intercepted an email that showed that the board was actually marketing our stations and they're worth a lot of money. These, these non-commercial radio stations that happened to be the oldest radio station in the dial thus is right in the middle of the dial with a big wide band and a lot of commercial possibility, right? So they, I, I found this, I, somebody made available this email that said they were pricing, you know, our radio station was like a uh, hundred million WBAI in New York, uh, a half a billion dollars. This was big money. So I read it on the air and these armed guards who were, by then were sitting out in front of my studio watching me uh, coming and going. With the, with, the, with the rifles popping out of the back and free speech radio. Uh, I came out of that live broadcast and a manager that they had brought in to obviously to shut us down in the middle of the night and get rid of me, stopped me in the hallway and says, you have to go out the door. And I said, no, I left my keys upstairs. Uh, I have to go get my car keys. I'm sorry. He says, no, you have to leave now. We'll get you your car keys. I went up the stairs, two flights of stairs. The the six o'clock news had started. I went into the newsroom. We were live on the air. They were broadcasting, broadcasting a story about healthcare. I ripped the, we were using reel to reel tape at that time. They were broadcasting the tape part of the story. I took the tape off. We went live and people heard me screaming at three or four armed men to keep their guns in their holsters. <sighs> Oh this happened. Lord. This is what happens. You know, we have we love the First Amendment in the United States, you know, and they say there's this part of the First Amendment where they say you can't you're you can't scream uh, fire in a crowded theater if there's no fire. You not the, the the First Amendment doesn't allow you to do that. But what it really does encourage you to do if there is a fire and you don't speak out about it. You know, if you don't uh, say, hey, everybody, you better get the hell out of this theater because you're going to burn down, then it's your responsibility, right? And that's, that's, that's Julian Assange coming on the scene and talking about, you know, this, this, these fires in the theater of our life, in the politics, in, in the way things are unfolding in the world, where Madeleine Albright can, you know, be asked you know, aren't you concerned that your policy led to the killing of a half a million kids? And she, uh, you know, do you, do you, don't you think you want to rethink it? And she says, no, I do exactly the same thing. I don't know, Julian Assange, wherever the hell you, I hope you can hear all of this happening on your behalf because, you know, th this is our fight. And anybody who really calls themselves a journalist needs to stand up 
and make it do. I can't, my friend Randy Credico, who I do these programs with, he's at, the, he's at the correspondence meeting and he gets, stands up on a chair and he says, hey, what about all you journalists? What about Julian Assange? And they drag him the hell out of there and there's no reports on it at the journal. This is the, at the, this is the, the White House. It's at the White House correspondence dinner, yeah. correct? No, no stories. DC. Jimmy Dore did it. I did it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw the segment with Jimmy Dore and, of course, who we just had on before this. I saw his segment with Randy about that and how remarkable. And I'm so proud that this is our community. Our community has the guts to stand up and call those journalists out, you know, to hold power to account. And I, I am so proud of that. And I honestly don't understand how anybody who takes the sellout option can look themselves in the mirror at night. Uh, I totally agree with you. And I, I just to, to pick up where Jimmy left off in terms of the us listening, these correspondents now, uh, the, you know, the former CIA and FBI and, you know, all the serial liars who have been lying us into three decades of terrible, dastardly, horrific wars um, for corporate profit that, you know, every year now I do a special on September 11th, on 9-11. It's a special about nine, two 9-11s. It's the 9-11 of 2001, and it's the 9-11 of September 11th, 1973, when the US, the CIA, all these guys who everybody's fallen in love will, with now, the new CNN and MSNBC correspondents were a part of that plan to overthrow the duly constituted constituted government of Salvador Allende and bring on a most extraordinarily violent dictatorship. I mean, we, so every September 11th, everybody thinks we're doing 211. Well, we, we do them both. And we do it with the, the incredibly fine award-winning poet, Martina Spada, who's sort of considered the Pablo Neruda of North America. And if you don't know who Pablo Neruda is, you should go out and read some poetry. But Neruda was Chilean. He, they say he, they say, some say he died of cancer as the coup was unfolding. Others say he died of heartbreak uh, as the coup was unfolding. But we, we, we were just talking with Mart Martin. We were talking, he was, I was asking him, so Martin, what do you think about this collusion in Russia? And he says, collusion? You want to talk about collusion? How about the collusion led by Henry Kissinger in terms of the overthrowing of the government? talking about getting involved in the internal affairs of other people's government. There was a beautiful, a beautiful, peaceful revolution with Salvador Doriende that brought in the new song and theater movement that caught fire throughout Latin America, led by folks like Victor Jara. What happened to Victor Jara, the hero of the people? You know, the United States, what did they do? They they supported a coup that took this hero, this poet, this singer, and put him in a stadium with thousands of other people who were tortured and murdered, and they shot him down in front of the people as he was singing for freedom. This, I'm, getting, I'm talking about the agents who are now our correspondents on CNN and MSNBC. What did they do? What did, what did our New York Times do to get us into Iraq? Judith Miller, first she went to jail and then she went back as a correspondent for Fox after she was the, what, the court stenographer for the Bush administration to lie us into war. Did I say that already? I wanted people to remember that that was the New York Times, your paper, paper of record. And when is the last time you heard the word Palestine on Rachel Maddow? when she talks about brutality and the horrors of the Trump administration. Uh, you know, there were massacres and mass murder took place while Rachel Maddow was ignoring it to cover the Trump story and raise her salary from two million to eight million a year. <laughs> you know, these executives brag about getting rich on Donald Trump. On Donald Trump. They say, yeah, he's a, bad, he's, a, he's a badass guy, but we're making lots of money. They made money on pumping them up 
and taking them down. Pump them up, take them That's down. That's exactly right. What That's exactly lie. right. We see them do that, um, not even just with the politicians, but even with like Kim.com in New Zealand. When Kim.com arrived in New Zealand, it was all super yachts and supermodels and fireworks and isn't this fantastic and how exciting that we have a great internet entrepreneur and the FBI rolled in to take him down and all of a sudden it was uh, his terrible, just hit piece after hit piece, smear piece after smear piece, you know, just absolutely trying to destroy his reputation. And he had to like, he had to piece by piece himself through truth telling uh, get the message through to the New Zealand people about what he was really about, why he was really taken down. He was taken down because he donated 25,000 euros to WikiLeaks, yes. because he supported WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, yes. because he, he was planning to give millions to WikiLeaks. He was planning to support this transparency organization. And his business, which he had started, was so successful, so epically successful, that it was doing better than the Disney company, you know, similar or com, uh, competing corporates. Yes. Um, I, I think Mega Upload was 5% of the internet traffic worldwide. And that's why Kim.com was taken down. That's why the media smeared the hell out of him. And that is the real collusion. When I see a BBC documentary about Henry Kissinger and during his time in the Nixon White House, and they um, are depicting him as the man of peace, the restrained man of peace who was, all, who was ever present to rein in the excesses of Nixon, because Nixon was the warmonger, but Henry Kissinger was the messenger of peace. He was the, the white dove in the White House. Like, nothing could be further from the truth. It's an offense to the historical record, but honest to God, you can go and sit there and watch this BBC-produced crap totally whitewashing genocide you know decades worth of genocide and, and meddling around the world oh yeah we of course we could never forget indonesia where uh, the rivers ran red with the blood of the people after kissinger participated in uh, uh in collaborating to overthrow sukarno bringing into the slaughter of suharto and the you know all the stuff that happened in East Timor after it's unbelievable. Remember, Henry Kissinger had some problems in terms of traveling abroad uh, at a certain point in his career based on the various things that he had done. But I, uh, when Kissinger was in the White House, he called, uh, he called the meeting of all the foreign ministers of Central and South America because he wanted to let them know something. Uh, his message, you know, particularly Chile was complaining about the, the, the brutal economic policies that, was, that were crushing people throughout the region as the Monroe Doctrine continued uh, in terms of the U.S. owns everything south of the border. Um, Kissinger called in the foreign ministers and he wanted to let them know that if they thought they had anything to say, if the United States could give a damn about them, they're wrong. Uh, policy doesn't happen north to south. They were nothing. They were just resources for the United States. We do business from east to west. And not far after that was the, you know, was the, the coup in Chile. And Kissinger promised any, that meeting with those foreign ministers, his message was, sit down and shut up or we're going to screw with you. That's U.S. foreign policy. And both Clinton and you know, didn't Hillary Clinton, the liberal, claim Kissinger as her uh, as her visionary for foreign policy? Didn't she talk about that? Her mentor, her mentor, her mentor and that was yeah. why it was so disturbing to me when um, President Trump went straight to, as I said to Jimmy, to have tea and scones with Henry Kissinger. So what? He's he's Kissinger as Trump's mentor now. I mean, is this not just like entirely indicative of the problem? that no matter whether it's left or right administration, no matter whether it's Republicans or Democrats, it's the same puppet masters pulling the strings. Absolutely. Now, I, ha I want to sort of name names here. I hope this is okay. Back to that getting arrested and dragged out of that radio station. Enough of it went on the air, happened live. It sounds around out there. So that a lot of people were listening and they were really concerned of me screaming at these guys to keep their guns in the holsters. So within, you know, five or 10 minutes, 
there were hundreds, probably over a thousand people were out in front of the radio station. And actually there were already over a hundred sitting in downstairs. There were a couple of police wagons to arrest a lot of people, but the wagons were paralyzed because dozens of people had crawled under them in front of the wheels. So they were simply immobilized uh, there and nobody would be arrested. Meanwhile, I'm upstairs uh, in the news studio. The police are taking over the station, all this kind of stuff. And somebody comes charging into the, the there, were, uh, there were a number, of, Barbara Lubin of the Middle East Children's Alliance had come in to sit down with me. We were already locked down in that radio studio after they shut us down. They had planned to shut us down in the middle of the night. I had learned about this, so I broke this during before we could go off the air at 2 a.m. and then come on with tapes of Noam Chomsky and you know other things that sort of sounded like who we were until they could do what they really wanted to do with our beautiful network. Uh, so there were a thousand people out front, hundred people downstairs, and uh, a wonderful young anti-police activist named Van Jones came charging into the studio. Van Jones now does a, a show on CNN on Saturdays. Uh, and Van Jones came in, he hugged me. He said, this is one of the most important media stories of our time. If this station goes down, we all go down. We have to preserve this really flagship of free speech in the Bay Area. It was well known, we were not marginal. Uh, and he said, there's a thousand people outside. What do you want me to tell them? What's our struggle? He says, I think this is the most important. As I say, exactly what you said, Van, that this is the free speech, truth to power. Our job as an alternative information source is crucial. Go tell them that, that uh, you know, to bring 10 of their friends back next week, because this is going to be a real struggle. So, he went outside, I could hear through the window, I'm already sort of doing news interviews while they're trying to, the police chief is trying to talk me into going out, walking out and I'm saying, no, I'm not gonna be walking out. I'm, you're gonna have to drag me out, all this stuff. So Van Jones, wherever you are on CNN, I think you should use one of your shows because this Julian Assange is one of the most important if not the most important free speech news story of our time, wherever, however it goes for Julian Assange, it goes for all of us. We have to protect this journalist, this publisher. So Van, you got a show there. Mainstream is terrified. They keep thinking it's their job to say Julian Assange should be prosecuted. I think if I remember correctly, and I do remember that beautiful hug you gave me for standing up, you need to come back out of the woodwork now and give us a call and sign in and do a show here and let people know what's at stake. And maybe call up that New York Times attorney who says they could be prosecuted too and we could all be prosecuted and sort of make that stand. <laughs> you know it? <laughs> That's what I'm good about. That's what I want to say. Oh, you didn't make the call. Sorry, I got the wrong end of the stick there. I thought you meant no. that you... you no. Made... no, I want him to... I'm just saying... Oh, you're, um, you're now making the call. Yeah, I'm just saying, come on. Uh, how about a hug for Julian Assange? Why don't you bring the cameras over there uh, and open up the floodgates to the most important... Uh, one of the most important publishers of our time. That's absolutely right. absolutely and in my experience unfortunately the only way you can get real mainstream media coverage for a, a freedom movement like this is to drag them kicking and screaming on the heels of millions of people already on the streets demanding it and it may be that that's the the road that we have to take and that's the road that we are certainly on right now which is to create to take what's become an online manifestation and move it to the streets um i'm particularly interested given your experience um, what is your take on, on the role of people power as an interventionist force against the political powers that are currently um, pulling the strings on the Julian Assange situation? Well, no, I love that people power. I, right over my shoulder, I don't know if you can see her clearly, is Patti Smith. 
uh, who is uh, a, really a rock icon, the people's uh, sort of rock and roller, um, right over my shoulder, and she's got people power. I don't know if you've ever heard this song. Maybe somebody could dig it out and play it during this uh, flow uh, in support of Julian Assange. Uh, but, the, you know, when in this country, Obama showed up, so all the liberals thought their, their days in the streets were over. But obviously he became one more war for a uh, flat for war. So, you know, there's been a problem in terms of getting people into the streets to stand up uh, for things that really mean something. But, you know, uh, Trump's serial racism and his, um, his willingness to destroy the families of tens of thousands of, uh, shall we say, the workers who do the hardest work in this country but only get uh, beaten, arrested, marginalized, and deported when it's necessary. Uh, this, this treatment of young children by this white supremacist uh, leadership has gotten people's attention. And through that, the beginning of that revolution where people do not like the idea of smashing families and creating so much suffering and all the, the young moms and their children who they don't even know where half these kids are. This has uh, gotten people uh, excited. Now, of course, there's a, a problem because the corporate mainstream is lost, you know, they don't really know what to ask Donald Trump. So they just use this word collusion and say Russia, instead of doing their job. Uh, you know, this president can be dealt with uh, for many things he, he deserves to be dealt with, but not, you know, uh, what is Rachel Maddow, 92% of her show time is on Trump and where are the kids? Uh, so there's a lot of attention. There are a lot more people in the streets. People are concerned about what's happening in terms of women's rights and uh, in terms of the, the Roe v. versus Wade. So people are a little bit concerned about that disappearing. So, there's, so the idea is to begin to talk about this in a larger context, to uh, talk about Julian Assange and what's happening in terms of freedom of speech in the context of some of the other struggles and to, to make it a part of that struggle. I mean, you can't tell the real story of what's going on if you don't have an independent press, if you don't have truth tellers willing to be out there. So this is, uh, you know, I'm hoping that, that, that people power uh, and the, the sheer brutality that, that we're seeing at the domestic level, the realization by more and more people that whatever the United States is willing to do in terms of brutalities and foreign policy, they will turn on their own people. They will do the same, thing, same things at home to sustain the policies and the sort of corporate power abroad. So, you know, this is the battle. It's, a, it's a, an uphill struggle uh, and it's no surprise. Who would they they will go to kill the canary every time they will, you know, the, and the more desperate uh, the corporate meet, the corporate establishment gets, uh, the more frightening the resistance, the more effective the resistance, i.e. Julian Assange, the harsher the response. So this is, I think this is where we are. I think what you're doing, Susie, you know, the idea of our, our power, Jimmy Dore, you know, got a lot of people listening there. Our power is in our ability to collaborate. You know, that's why, you know, um, WikiLeaks was so crucial in the collaboration, in the, you know, they, it was just a piece in the big puzzle of coming back to that responsibility of monitoring the center of power. Amira Haas, a very fine reporter who, who writes for Haaretz uh, in um, the West Bank. Courageous reporter, real truth teller, really you know, has talked extensively about this responsibility. It is our job to be there. We are not, right now, the, the media, the corporate media in America is like part of the, the, the power structure. 
they're not supposed to be invited. They, they like getting invited to the parties, but that's not the way it should be. Bob Perry, you mentioned my my hero, my good friend. I I I, I, I traveled with Bob Perry and Gary Webb, who broke the story. Oh my God! The the, the CIA's. Uh, I did a, a tour called Giants of Journalism, where I toured with Bob Perry, uh, Gary Webb, and another journalist who had broken, uh, how, showed how the CIA had used the failure of savings and loans banks in America to finance illegal off-the-shelf operations, including contra drug operations and all this kind of stuff. I, 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 you know, I don't even know where to start in that, in watching. Bob Perry was the first person, and I did a little bit of, on the first round of breaking the, the story about the way in which the CIA had engaged drug dealers as a part of their operation to overthrow the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, right? That was the, the general story. And then Gary Webb, 10 years later, put the end result on it. He showed how the CIA's uh, decision to work with uh, cocaine traffickers uh, led to a cocaine epidemic in South Central Los Angeles and in poor communities across the country. So they hated him. Oh, the CIA hated him. They even had to send somebody to LAA to have a public meeting and say, no, it didn't happen. Anyway, I sat there as Bob Perry during that tour tried to warn Gary that he was in danger, that when you do a story like this, you have to be incredibly careful. And Gary was so sure his, his editors at the San Jose Mercury News were behind him, were uh, totally, and I went to a meeting where, with his editors at the KQED, the public radio building here in the Bay Area, where his editor said how proud he was of Gary Webb and the work they were doing. And this was the first story. It was extraordinary because that contra drug story, the Dark Alliance was the first one to use the internet big time to get the story out beyond the bounds. So it was, it was an extraordinary situation. And, you know, about two months later, those same editors were attacking Gary, were apologizing for the story, were retracting the story. But I remember before that happened, traveling with Bob and Gary and Bob saying, you've got to be careful. They're going to come get you. Bob, he was thrown out of the AP because they came in, they gave him a lecture about how he was, you know, they weren't going to be invited to these parties anymore in the White House where they needed to make contact and stuff. And Bob said, my job is not to go and have a freaking party with the White House, but to tell the truth about them. Bye. We don't want you at uh, the Associated Press. We don't want you at, uh, uh, at the Newsweek. Bob Perry's story, the first story in 1985 about the Contra drug connection was released by accident. Do you know that? It was an accident. It was only supposed to go out in the Spanish-speaking press. But accidentally, it went to AP. And that's the only reason we heard about that story. It was an accident. Unbelievable. I've and studied all of everything that you're just referencing. I've studied, but I had absolutely no idea that you had toured with them. That's and and that you knew Gary at that time. That is absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, and he was oh, beautiful, and um, he he couldn't get a job in journalism. He he no he he couldn't. To, they wouldn't hire him to hire the art show you know, in rural Sacramento. And it, 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 this is, and of course we know that Gary Webb was vindicated, right? By the CIA itself with its inspector general's report that included everything, including the memo that Ronald Reagan signed in 1984 with his first attorney general, the chief US law enforcement official that allowed, it was a secret finding that allowed US federal agents to work with drug traffickers, to turn a blind eye to drug traffickers if they were uh, engaged in operations that were so-called national security. That was Gary Webb nailing that story. The end game. The, the drug epidemic, the cocaine epidemic, fueled by Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan, whose main job as first lady was just say no to drugs. 
She's in one part of the White House having a press conference about just say no to drugs. And her husband is signing the secret finding that allows federal agents to essentially collaborate with drug traffickers in order to overthrow the Sandinista government because they're coming over the southern border of the United States. It's unbelievable. This is reminding me. This is reminding me of Serena Shem. I'm I'm close friends with Serena Shem's mother. Yes. I assume that you know about her case. What? At a high level, the best way I can describe this is that mainstream media like to be second on a story, but they never like to be first. They actually don't want the, the scoop first if it is of a seriously political nature or relating to right. um, the military industrial complex. If they're second on a story, they can always go, oh, well, those people published it, you know, they, go see them, like, <laughs> but they don't want to be first. The reason they don't want to be first is because Gary Webb was first and look what happened mm. to him. Serena Shim was the first to report that weapons and supplies were going to ISIS on UN world food trucks across the border into Syria from Turkey. She was the first to go into the refugee camps and show the giant flat screen TVs and the ISIS fighters and all yes. of the, and, and show that Turkey was the supply line to ISIS in Syria. Yes. Um, they called her a conspiracy theorist. They marginalized her. They attacked her and eventually they killed her. They flat out killed her. Fast forward two and a half years and all of her reporting was vindicated. Everybody knows that that's how ISIS fighters were being supplied. It's now become a con what was conspiracy theory when she was putting her life on the line to report it is now conventional wisdom. Even to the extent that Trump and others, you know, allude to it in the presidential campaign. This is how widespread the knowledge has become. But when it was just her bravely reporting from the front lines of those countries with nothing more than her cousin as a cameraman and, you know, a camera, and that was it. She didn't have protection. She didn't have power. She didn't have influence. She was risking her life every single day to tell the truth. She was first, and she was killed. Gary Webb was first. He also paid the ultimate price one way or another uh, for his reporting. WikiLeaks is first. Over and over and over again, WikiLeaks is first. First to the story, first to reveal the truth, and they are huge truths. Huge truths. Truths that affect millions, if not billions of people. Truths that completely change yes. our understanding about the way that our societies, which are underpinned by the systems of control operated by the intelligence agencies on behalf of what they internally refer to as their customers, customers like the Federal Reserve Bank of America, for example, in the case of the National Security Agency. WikiLeaks lays that bare and WikiLeaks is first. WikiLeaks is not only are they first, they are never second because in the constitution of WikiLeaks, it states, they will only publish primary source documents that have never appeared elsewhere or which are under uh, serious threat of censorship if there is active uh, suppression of yes. the document. But they, they publish first on principle and as an inherent part of their structural design. They are first. They bring the scoops. They break the stories, the biggest stories. So, every, so WikiLeaks is the, the ultimate honouring of the sacrifice of Gary Webb, of Serena Shim, of Michael Hastings, of countless other journalists who have paid the ultimate price as a result of their inability to co uh, compromise their ethics and their morality um, in a corrupt world. I agree. Um, what you just said is absolutely crucial for people to understand uh, obviously, it's why I'm participating in this. Um, I don't, uh, it's confounding to me that journalists would not grok the idea, the, would not embrace fully the importance of having the availability of, you know, what's in Vault 7 or, you know, just take your pick uh, or just that one video, collateral murder, changing history. It's, again, standing at the crossroads of history, watching what's going on, and trying to do something about it. 
And here, WikiLeaks creates a structure for publishing some of the most significant documents in terms of understanding what is happening, uh, what are the nuts and bolts behind what is happening in our world, because what is happening is frightening, and we're facing some terrific challenges. And without the information, you cannot inform yourself. So the, in terms of the, the little d Democrats of the world, having the information we need to make the decisions for the future, this is, this is, this is it. This is, this is what hangs in the balance. And so we, the, the, we, I'm proud to stand up with you, Susie, and what you're doing here, uh, and stand up for this, um, uh, really historical, um, I don't know, I have to say, one of the most publish, important publishers, I, I want to use the word publisher, because he really does, uh, Julian really does an extraordinary job in terms of publishing the material and making it available uh, uh, in a way that it's, you can utilize the material and it can change history. It gives you the power. You know, you go into the trenches, you have your microphone, you, t you, you, you have to start with the people who are suffering on the front lines and see what they're saying. Uh, and you want, to, you want to document what's happening on the ground. But then you need you need the depth of the documents. You need to know what's going on, who's engaged, how the policy is unfolding, so that you can really tell the big picture of what is happening in our world. And uh, again, I'm shocked. I, you know, journalists should should be really, you know, banging down the doors to save the life and the work of uh, WikiLeaks, so that they can continue doing their own work in the best possible manner. I mean, I, you know, there's nothing else to say. That's what it's about. I'm sure there's lots to say, but- uh, There are the creme de la creme of independent journalists who are, are on this part of this movement and are, are seen on these online vigils like yourself who are doing that. Unfortunately, the other journalists will have to respond to social pressure from their peers when the inevitable event comes yes. that the public demand better treatment for Julian Assange and demand his freedom. Because I've seen it time and time again in New Zealand. I, I've gone through the trans, you know, first they uh, ignore you, then they ridicule you, and then you fight them and then you win. That's, I've, mm. I've gone through that, that full cycle several times where the media would not cover or even acknowledge i mean this movement's a great example no, no mainstream media has acknowledged the existence of this movement despite the fact that for four months we've been running online vigils that probably qualify for the guinness book of records and <laughs> have pulitzer prize winners and you know uh, yeah. other incredibly amazing people on it they will not even acknowledge our existence i don't even worry about that so much because i know that as we continue the organizing and progress over time a time will come where they will have no choice but to acknowledge it and where um they will risk their own reputations audiences and standings if they if they don't acknowledge and cover it so for me i'm more concerned about getting um you know, Joe and Jane blogs down the road to know about yes. this movement than I am about getting CNN to know about it because the people are the ones that we need to bring on. The people are the ones we need to bring together. And that's why we named this Unity for Jay because this, um, this movement is not just attempting to secure liberation for Julian Assange, but it is in some ways, and this was unintended consequence, but it is in some ways providing a measure of healing for a society which has been completely fractured by the 2016 election. And that healing is coming from acceptance and a platform of inclusion. Because we're saying, we don't care who you voted for. We don't care if you didn't vote. We don't, you know, we don't care what your political affiliation is. This platform exists to free a man. And if you are prepared to give time and resources and love and care and attention to making that happen, you are welcome here, no matter what your political affiliation is. And this society has been so, it's just been divide and conquer playbook for years now. And people are almost 
and a kind of, of shell shock from it. And because it's horrible, oh, literally, there are marriages breaking up, families breaking apart, friendships breaking up over politics. It's, um, it's just absolutely unbelievable, the, the havoc that has been wreaked upon society by, by this divide and conquer agenda. And as soon as you say to people, you know what? You're welcome here, no matter what you think or what you believe. It's okay if we're different because we're going to do something together and we're going to make a difference. And I watch, I watch the tension fall away from people as they come and participate in the movement because they don't have to worry anymore. They don't have to um, politically profile everybody around them to see if they're on the accepted, acceptable list. You know, and, and it's allowing people to be human again. And I think that that's a, a really beautiful thing. And Julian Assange, the uh, last interview of mine that he shared on his account, he actually had it set to a specific timestamp. And when you played it, it was me talking about the Occupy movement and the 99%. And I was uh, discussing about how at Occupy, everybody who was a member of the 99% was welcome, whether they were environmentalists or conservatives, whether they were libertarians or, you know, anarchists or anything. You know, the full political spectrum was inside the 99% because all of them yes. were suffering and toiling under the effects yes. of the same policies. And so if there is any achievement that I would claim for this movement, it would be that we are remembering that we are the 99%. You uh, are doing an incredibly good job here and a beautiful service. And uh, unity is really what it's about at this point, sort of trying to find a way back together. I think that's what I was trying to say before in terms of the, you know, um, um, people are, are troubled. Uh, they're dealing with a lot. They're not sure what's happening in the world. Uh, but I do think uh, again, when we start to come together and we start to share sort of what the struggle is at the grassroots level and uh, where we can find our own power, Susie, at the, you know, at the people level, then we're going to we're going to do better. I, you know, I, I'm somebody who grew up out of the 60s, uh, who saw the power of people coming together. Um, I, you know, I think that drives has driven me all the way through my life. Uh, that there is a hope for change. And uh, I, what I've learned, you know, in terms of my career after all these years is that among other things, there is it, the power is in the people and it's, the, it's in the people to be able to be informed uh, so that they have the right kind of information so that they can think critically and have context to what's going on. And, uh, you know, I want to, the information is power. I want to be a part of that movement uh, that sort of breaks the hold on the open flow of information. And that's what Julian Assange does. He, he you know, he, he breaks it open and he makes information available and people can decide what they want to do with it, how they want to understand it, how they want to use it. This is, this is our struggle. And uh, what you're doing again is um, courageous, and, um, you know, it's, it's going to help us to change history. Thank you. That is the most incredibly profound and beautiful thing that you could say. Um, I would just say I can't do it without you, without 2,600 people now on our organizing platform, without 60 or 70 guests that we've had come through the online vigils, without... 45,000 people that were watching the Periscope stream this morning without them. Because, you know, I could like go stand with a sign somewhere by myself, but at the end of the day, I'd be by myself unless someone's prepared to listen. And there are incredible, incredible people working on this movement in front of the camera and behind the camera. There are people who say nothing to me, but we can do it. Yes, we can. We can do it. Yeah. And, they are the people, they are the people who make this happen. This has just been the most incredible experience to be a part of. And we are like this far along the journey. We have so much more to go, um, but we are off to an amazing start. Um, so thank you so much for your kindness and for, for you being a part of it, because this is the, I'm always saying this, but it's, it's the empathy, the empathy is the common thread that binds us. 
you're an extremely empathetic person. It's very easy and obvious to tell that when you speak. You speak with, you conduct yourself with empathy. You, you speak with empathy. So is Julian. And that's something that's not often realized because the depiction of him by the mainstream media is such a distortion of his actual character. Julian is an extremely empathic person and that's why he's anti-war. That's why he exposes these massive crimes. That's why he saves the lives of whistleblowers and sources and at-risk journalists. You know, those that people know he has saved and those that people don't know he has saved. It's that empathy is the common thread that binds us and it's that empathy that gets us off our butts and gets us organizing to free this man so that we can save not just him, but everybody else who he will save in the future and who he will assist um, as a result of his work. Sorry. Oh, keep talking. Uh, it's it's an incredibly important thing to be doing, and I'm quite proud to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so 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 much, Dennis. Okay, we are going to. Oh, actually, you know what, Dennis? If the day comes that Julian actually does get his hands on a tape of this, if they rip him an MP3 and get it to him somehow or something, what would you like to say to him? Oh. Uh, see on the outside. <laughs> let's, keep, <laughs> let's keep doing the work now that you're free. I love it. Ray McGovern said that um, it's time for the Noah principle. Uh, no more predicting rain because, of course, we had all these articles saying, you know, the end is nigh, the end is nigh. And he says, no more predicting rain. It's time to build arcs. And Ray said, this movement is an arc. C can I add? Since the theme of our interview is me being ripped out of my radio station, understand that the when the first day there when I was in the studio, a thousand people came. The next week, two thousand people came. A month later, there were forty thousand people standing in front of the radio station and had taken over downtown, and we got our radio station back. It took the people to stand up to get off the Pacifica Radio Network back. Hallelujah. <laughs> so there you go. You're, li you're the living example that this can work. Yeah. yeah. That where there is That's a grave right. injustice, that there can be an interventionist force of everyday citizens. That is a phenomenal end to your story and to the segment. Thank you. Absolutely perfect. Thank you so much, Dennis. It's been an absolute pleasure and a learning experience for me. That's, I'm absolutely floored by your stories about Gary Webb and about Bob Perry. So thank you so much for that.